Dwayne and Becky in the, in the morning. So on our previous podcast episode, we talked about abuse disguised as biblical discipline. And a friend just asked, what has been my healing journey in the last couple of years of just processing this? So I just figured I'd share kind of my story, my life story in a nutshell, I guess. Get to know Becky. There's there's a lot that we've unpacked and that's why we're sharing. And so I, yeah. the layup, um, yeah, it left a lot to be wanted. So. so once upon a time, there was a child named Becky. And I grew up hearing, someday you'll have a child who's just like you and then you'll understand what it's like. Um, and the message that I received with that was, I'm a burden and it costs people to be with me. And my primary love language, I'm pretty sure, is quality time. But my parents are busy. My older sister was sick. My little sister was a baby. And so I learned that if I gave acts of service, I could hopefully receive quality time. At least that was my subconscious strategy that I came up with. It's like, my parents are busy, so if I join them in what they're doing, I can spend time with them, which meant being helpful. It did not work. But I remember one time I offered to help my mom with the dishes and she was like, I didn't know you liked washing the dishes. And so she left to let me wash the dishes by myself. But I remember standing there on a stool so I could reach the kitchen sink because I was that small and just staring at like all the dirty dishes and crying because I had wanted to spend time with my mom. And instead of getting that quality time, I was given this huge task that I had no idea how to do. No one had taught me how to wash dishes. And now I was too afraid to be like, hey, mom, can you come back? I don't know how to wash the dishes because she'd be like, well, why'd you offer to help do the dishes if you don't know how to do the dishes? I'm like, because I thought we'd do it together. So I just remember standing there on a stool at the kitchen sink crying. And it's like, well, I guess you just splash some water around and make things look clean. So, you know, I did the best I could. And then after that, I think there must have been more times that I offered to help to the point that mom started calling me her number one helper. And so even though I wasn't receiving quality time, I was at least I'd found a way to like earn value and to be special, to be important. Um, as long as I worked hard enough and did a good job. So one thing that we've realized in parenting our own children is when my children start helping me empty the dishwasher, it's not because they like emptying the dishwasher. It's probably because I'm busy and they want to spend time with me. I think I even asked, why are you helping me empty the dishwasher? And she's like, because I want to be with you. Which is what Ariasha says all the time. She's like, I just want to be with you. She doesn't need anything. She just wants to be with us. Um, yeah, so I don't know if you have any thoughts on just that part. It's, it's easy to become busy. Yeah. Uh, but those words meant to be like one day you'll understand what i'm going through as a parent that does not speak the same thing to a kid so don't say that right yeah. <laughs> it's a terrible thing <laughs> you're just like right one day you'll understand Which, uh, yeah. at that point i liked myself so i'm like i don't understand why people don't like me i don't know what's wrong with me but clearly something is wrong with me yeah. like i'm deficient in something and i need to do the best i can to fix this yeah, problem right and then it becomes how can i solve this problem and yeah. and then your your problem solving almost worked only to not get any quality create time and, yeah. and create a box that then you know you locked yourself in for more than a decade way more than a decade yeah like, way more than three decades three decades we're gonna go with at least three, that, three yeah. decades of living in the mama's little helper box in the just general being helpful box um, yeah, so that did carry over, I think, into the church culture. So it's like, I know we're saved by grace through faith and we can't earn it. But I also know that 20% of the people do 80% of the work. And I was one of those extra good Christians who served at church all the time. So I was one of the 20% that does the 80% and am like holier because of it. Um, <laughs> maybe not, just, but just so I know, had a lot she's of pride. holier than me. I just had a lot of pride in serving at church. Um, I mean, obviously volunteering at church also was a great way to avoid being at home. And if I wasn't at home, I wasn't in trouble. And so church was a safe place to go to. So I'm really thankful that I had church as a place to go. And I had Christian families to babysit for. And I got pay raises for being a good, helpful babysitter who did more than just watch the kids. I washed the dishes. I cleaned the house and did other things. But I think that was just mostly because that's what you're supposed to do is like be super extra helpful all the time. Um that's what I did and then the downside is I think when people now like do a sincere like oh thank you so much you're so helpful like I kind of freak out and panic a little bit I think subconsciously it's like I've successfully been helpful enough to make up for what it costs to be with me and in doing so I've tricked them into believing that I'm this helpful good person but if they actually knew me they would know you know someday you'll have a kid who's like you and then you'll understand like clearly they don't know the real me um they just know the helpful me which is kind of the real me but kind of isn't <laughs> Um, 
you know, and then I've heard people say like, oh, I wish you saw yourself the way I see you. And, you know, and I've said that, you know, I've seen that even in, in friends, like, I don't know why you think so poorly of yourself. Like, I wish you saw yourself the way I see you. Um, and I think I'm at least learning in people reflecting back to me, like how other people see me. Like, oh, you actually see me as helpful because I am helpful. I'm not faking or lying being helpful. Like, I actually am helpful. Um, and I am a good person. I'm not faking being a good person. Um, I don't know. It's kind of the... I think I saw most of my life, I saw myself through a lens of like guilt and shame and imposter syndrome. And my needs aren't valid because my older sister was sick. So I'm, my needs don't matter. Therefore, I don't acknowledge that I have needs. Yeah. And with, I guess, imposter syndrome, we talked about when our daughter was maybe two years old, we went to a church event that had Halloween, you know, harvest party, whatever go play all these games and get lots of free candy because churches give you even more candy than the world. So why go trick-or-treating when you can go to church and get lots and lots of candy? And I don't want freaking candy. Can we just play the games and have fun and skip the candy? Anyway, it was crowded and overwhelming. And we're like, that was insane. And then one of our friends whose daughter has Down syndrome is like, did you know you can go an hour early? They open an hour early for kids who have special needs and disabilities. I was like, oh, that's cool. That sounds like a great idea. Um, So the next year, that was my plan. But I had to, like, validate and justify why we were showing up an hour early. Like, if anyone asks why we're here, I'll just explain that Dwayne has a hearing aid and our daughter has hearing aids. And, I mean, you've said it's really hard in noisy environments to hear. It's really overwhelming. It's overwhelming for our daughter. Turns out I have some auditory processing, sensory processing. Like, I get overwhelmed and shut down in loud, crowded environments as well. So it just, it was just better for all of us to go an hour early when it was less crowded and catered to people who have special needs and disabilities um it's just comical because I'm like explaining it to you and like validating and justifying and Dwayne's like I wear a hearing aid like they open an hour early for people like me who have hearing aids and do better in a quieter environment like yes we're going early for our child because she qualifies to go early it's like oh I I guess but I still feel (laughs) Like, I know this is so funny. to you. I don't know. Like, if I get a package from Amazon and it arrives broken, I go on Amazon with fear and trepidation, feeling guilty, like, as if I'm the one who broke it and, like, trying to, like, justify and validate, like, no, it really did arrive broken. This isn't my fault. But I feel like it's my fault and I feel bad for saying anything. And it's really not my fault. Um, for some reason, it's really hard to learn that. It's strange, I guess. And that is probably, that's not even in my notes, but, like... The idea that everything is my fault. It's all your fault, Becky. Yep. It's like, it's not my fault. <laughs> it's not your fault. You did not impose anything on the FedEx truck to break your thing. Exactly. Like, you were in, you paid them to yeah. deliver it to you. I just, I feel like, I feel like I'm lying. Same with showing up an hour early because our kid has disabilities. Like, I feel like I'm lying. Yeah, that's imposter <laughs> like, syndrome. Yeah. So weird. So that's what I've been learning. Yeah, so three years ago then, for my healing journey that I've been on, um, a friend invited me to a Bible study she's hosting. And at the time, I was not going to church, and I did not like churchy things. And you're like, are you sure you want to go? I'm pretty sure a Bible study is a churchy thing. And I'm like, I'm pretty sure it is. Um, But I still believe in God, and I wanted to spend time with my friend. And I know she's busy, and if I want to spend time with her, I should join her in what she's doing, which in this case is a Bible study group. So I joined it so I could spend time with my friend. And it was fun and it was great and I made new friends. Um, And the Bible study that we did was called Souls Like Stars, which I think it's based out of one of those like trauma recovery centers where people go and spend a month or whatever in, not rehab, I guess recovery and and deal with their stuff. And so the Souls Like Stars Bible study has lots of questions. It's really good, I highly recommend it. And it also has like a lot of little stories that are somehow people's life story fits on a page. Um, I don't know how they do that because it takes me a lot longer to tell my story. Um, but yeah, their story is basically like I experienced this trauma and then I turned to these unhealthy things like drugs and alcohol and sex and whatever. Um, and then they end up coming to Jesus and recognizing the trauma and healing and it's, it's all beautiful, happy ending. And these people write their stories so neatly and beautiful. So one story was literally like my story. It's like her parents divorced. She wasn't allowed to talk about it. Um, she's like, same. Yeah, we weren't allowed to talk about it. Sleep under the rug, pretend everything's okay. Except the lady in the story totally goes off the deep end, and I don't remember what she did, drugs, alcohol, whatever. And I'm like, that is a very extreme reaction, because like, we have the same story, but I do not see the need to go to that unnecessary drama. Um, but it's like, wow, this is really interesting that we experienced the same thing, and that was what she turned to. And kind of this realization of like, I guess I could have gone down that same path, but I, I didn't. 
Because I guess I know those things aren't going to be helpful. But I think it's probably the first time that I recognized, like, we have the same story, and this lady is calling it, like, this is the trauma that happened that led her to, to go off the deep end. And I'm like, huh, interesting. Is that traumatic? I don't know. Um, and then the Bible study, the very last assignment, is just like, write your own short story. Um, but I was like, I couldn't do it. I've done this whole Bible study. I've answered all these questions. But I still felt like my life story is just like a bajillion mini stories and not like one big cohesive narrative. And maybe because of that time, I hadn't pinpointed like the original trauma that caused the fragmented chaos of multiple stories of my life. I could tell you my life story, life story in like, here's a bunch of bullet points that explain you know, my life story around homeschooling, my life story around church, my life story around whatever. And I could tell like three different life stories around a specific theme. But then like to put it all together, it was just like, I, I don't know. It's just, I have, it's all me. It's just, it just felt messy. Yeah. So at that point, I also felt really stuck just in life and in my relationship with God. And I felt like I should go back to church, even though I hate that idea. And I had a friend who's a new believer, and she'd invited me to church a couple times, and I kind of just, like, laughed at her. Um, kind of like, I don't want to taint your view of Christianity, but if you stick around the church long enough, you'll get hurt, and then you'll understand why people leave the church. Um, it, I don't know. It was a w- weird dynamics of, like, she thinks I had a great, wonderful life because I grew up in church, and lucky me that I didn't have to, like, she's just now learning the Bible and learning all these things, and I've grown up knowing it my whole life. And I'm like, yeah, and I've grown up knowing a whole bunch of other baggage on top of it that i got to figure out. Um, so lucky you that you get to start with a clean slate. Anyway, I decided if she was crazy enough to invite me for a third time that I would say yes. So a month later, we were hanging out like on a Saturday evening and talking about something, and she's like, hey, you want to go to church with me tomorrow? And I burst into tears, and then she was like, oh, sorry, just like, you don't have to go, like no pressure. I was like, no, I'll, I'll go. I guess I was waiting for her to ask, but I was also hoping she wouldn't ask. And I was like, oh, this is what happens if you hang out with someone on a Saturday night. That was, I set myself up for this. So the next day she picked me up. She gave me a ride so I don't have to deal with parking lot anxiety. I don't have to deal with find your friend at church anxiety, find a seat anxiety. It's like we arrive together, we go in together. That was very, very helpful for all my not wanting to go back to church anxiety. Um, but it felt like I was literally dragging my feet through the parking lot and she might as well have been like, holding my hand and dragging me into the building. In my mind, it's like fruit basket upset where you're like, just pick the first seat and sit down. Quick, hurry. Um, that's what I was feeling. I'm like, there's a seat, there's a seat, there's a seat. Why are we walking past all the seats? Where are we going? Um, and she's walking further and further into the building and my anxiety is going up and up and up until I'm finally like, where are we going? She's like, well, I normally sit like right here. She's totally calm, cool, collected. I'm like panicking. So we sat and it was all good. I mean, I had to wrestle through a lot of church wounds. Like I listed them all out. I was like, no, that's pretty valid. Um, I kind of just come to the sense of like church isn't perfect. If I go into expecting church to be perfect and expecting leaders to be perfect and then hating the fact that they sweep things under the rug and hide the mistakes, like I don't like any of that. Um, But if I go into it knowing that it's full of people who are not perfect and it's okay and I'm not expecting perfection, I'm actually went into expecting to be hurt. So, you know, very low low expectations or high expectations of bad things. I don't know. And then I ended up, you know, going back the next week, the next week, just because I felt like the corporate worship was really grounding um, and familiar. So I'm like, I guess, you know, I've been searching for something better than church, but I guess this is the best we've got for now. And maybe someday there will be something better. Um, but yeah. And my life experience was to show up at church and be super involved in ministry and volunteering um, so it was super weird to just show up and take up space and be a consumer. And subconsciously, I was also avoiding eye contact with leaders because I think that subconsciously, I thought that if they saw me, they'd be like, oh, hey, Becky, like they would recognize me and be like, you volunteered at your church and you were in missions and all this stuff. Like, let's put you to work. And so I'm like, don't see me. I'm not here. I don't have any skills. I'm not helpful. Um, yeah. So I've been going to this church and then I had a falling out with... Um, a friend, and I felt like I no longer trusted myself to be a good friend. But there was a lady at church who I thought was cool, and I wanted to get to know her. Um, and she's also a life coach. So I decided that I would hire her, and that way we could be friends with very clear boundaries. And so hopefully, like, I can't screw this up. Um, and she actually ended up helping me walk through all sorts of things, including the falling out with the other friend. And we ended up, like, being friends anyway. I'll have to pay people to be my friends. That's silly. But it was, it was a good strategy in that moment of falling apartness. <laughs> I'll just, I'll just pay you to spend time with me. Because, yeah, the whole uh, giving acts of service to get quality time is like, how about I just straight up pay you to spend time with me? That was my new strategy. It worked, actually, I think. And then in the process of going to life coaching and stuff, I also learned about triggers. 
And I had always thought triggers were like PTSD from like being in a war and you hear a loud noise and it sounds like a gunshot and you freak out. Um, but I realized that is that is PTSD. Um, triggers are actually like when something happens that causes you to like refeel the same feelings that you felt previously um, and kind of going into flight, fight and flight kind of over dramatically for the current situation is maybe what I would say. Around that same time, I had gotten an email from a friend who was also a life coach and her email was about triggers and had like a homework assignment worksheet. And our church was hosting their annual Like a Fire event, which is 36 hours of people taking turns reading the Bible out loud. Um, so I just went to sit and listen and have that beautiful atmosphere to do my homework from my life coach and from that email because I work from home and it was just nice to leave work and home and go to a different atmosphere to do that. One of the things that I did was just kind of listing out the lies I believed and asking God for his truth. So all these lies of like, I'm too much, I'm not enough. I have to give acts of service to earn quality time, but it doesn't even work. And then one of them in particular that was like, kind of just felt like a random one that I hadn't normally felt, but I'd felt recently was just like, I shouldn't be here. And to that, I felt like God said, you belong, you belong here. And that was the first time that I like looked around the church sanctuary and felt at home. And most people at this church say that their very first Sunday, they walked in and they instantly felt at home. I told you about my first Sunday where I felt very uncomfortable. Anyway, but my experience at a previous church was that we walked in and felt at home and it was great until it wasn't. And then when crap hit the fan, we left. So now four years later, returning and coming to this church, I think if I'd walked in and felt at home, like I would have run. Like I'm not falling for whatever that trick is. Um, yeah, so I felt very uncomfortable my first Sunday and basically every Sunday for 10 months of going to this church. Um, and the friend who invited me had moved away, so I'm going to church by myself, which did not help, but was probably good for me. But anyway, yeah, 10 months at this church, taking up space and doing nothing to earn my right to be here. And then just a sense God say, like, you belong here. It was just like a really powerful moment for me. And right after that, I accidentally made eye contact with one of the pastors and I just smiled because that's a normal thing that people do when you're like, hey, smile. Um, and he smiled back. And then I was like, <gasps> and I think that was kind of the moment that I realized that I'd been avoiding eye contact. And all of a sudden it's like, I, like, I feel seen, but also like I feel safe to be seen, which is really good. Right after that, I think is when I applied to do Emerge, which is the mentorship program at our church. So that started maybe six months later, I think. And so then at opening weekend, I had two different pastors gave me prophetic words or whatever you want to call it. One of them said, the story that you're writing is too small. You need to write a bigger story, which is like exactly what I was told by the publishing company when I wrote the story about my daughter getting hearing aids. Um, she told me that and I ended up writing Wonderfully Different, Wonderfully Me children's book. And now at this point in life, we're talking about writing a story about Dwayne, you know, growing up with Teacher Collins syndrome and our daughter. Um, but I wasn't necessarily going to even be in that story that we were going to write. So I was like, oh, okay, I need to write a bigger story that probably includes me and my story. <laughs> and then the other pastor, um, I was just talking to a friend about something painful that had happened, and he came over and said hi and went right back to talking about this. But he, like, stopped me and was like, you need to write that down. You need to write a book. And that was, you know, all the same weekend that that happened. So I was like, oh, okay, like, I write all the time. Like, I've published a book already. Um, but I realized, like, that there's stories that I've never written down because they're painful and if I actually write it down then it makes it real plus other people could read it um, which also makes it more real so you have to acknowledge that it happened um, and I think I've always had this fear you know like maybe that I had experienced some traumatic event that I had blocked and I don't remember and like and that's that's the problem this this thing that I don't remember um, which as of yet I have not uncovered that but in writing my stories you know all these stories that I already knew about I'm just they're painful so I didn't want to write them um, writing them, I've been forced to like acknowledge the pain and feel the pain that, you know, maybe even at the time I suppressed, ignored, you know, I'm like, oh, it's no big deal. This doesn't affect me. And it's like, no, actually this was a big deal. And it does affect me in ways that I'm just now realizing, you know, 20, 30 years later. And then we also had the opportunity to like share our life story in our small group, which was like what two and a half hours of sharing my life story. So a much longer version than what you just heard. And kind of just in that process of like preparing the like, what are the, the bullet point stories and stuff that I wanted to share in that, you know, I like I always had felt like I had this great, wonderful life and like, I didn't really need God. I just, my life was good. Um, but then taking time to write like the actual, like the hard, painful stories and stuff. I was like, this is crazy. Like, how am I okay? And then I realized like, oh, like God is the reason that I'm okay. And, you know, most of my wounds and trauma came from church, from Christian people, actually all 
I don't think I know anyone who's not a Christian. So, <laughs> I mean, I probably do. But for the most part, it's all from church, from leaders, from parents, from people who've twisted scriptures to justify abuse, from people who've twisted scriptures to hide abuse. But at the same time, it's like, I'm so thankful that I grew up in the Christian community that I grew up in and that I had all these good people in my life, like the families I babysat for, you know, all the way through till now with my life coach and my mentor. It's like, like, I'm really thankful for the Christian environment that I've lived in most of my life and like the positive impact that's had on my life. And that's the reason I'm okay. And the pastor of the church we go to says like wounds happen in community, but healing happens in community. So yeah, that's my story.